the Delmarva Almanac. Each week we connect you to the best of Delmarva. Like other almanacs, our aim is to tell you a little bit about our past, our present, and events in the near future. I'm your host, Dana Kester McKay. Our next story is the first in an ongoing series of Delmarva Community Oral Histories. This time we'll meet civil rights activist Gloria Richardson Dandridge. Gloria's family moved to the Eastern Shore to live with her grandmother during the Depression. Her father opened a drugstore in the predominantly African-American Second Ward of Cambridge. Gloria came from the St. Clair family, who were affluent members of that community. Gloria shared her story with me by phone from New York. I guess I lived in kind of a bubble because the Second Ward uh, was totally black. Uh, They had almost everything they needed except the hospitals and the fire department, and city um, institutions. Uh, we did, they didn't allow us to use the ambulance. Um, and so, you know, black folks got together and bought their own ambulance and, and uh, hired a driver. My grandfather was a city councilman for about 50 years representing the second ward. They, at their banquets, they would bring his meals out to him rather than have them with the other city council people. The Freedom Rider campaign brought people to Delmarva targeting towns in Maryland near Washington, where legislators lived and where segregation was rampant. Then, because they were chasing the governor who lived in Christie, Maryland, down the eastern shore in buses, and my uncle and cousin provided the bail for them because they stopped off in towns and had little sins and got arrested. So when they were coming back from Crisfield three or four days later, um, my cousin, Frederick St. Clair, said, you know, Cambridge is totally segregated. You all really need to stop off there. So they dropped off two field organizers who then stayed at my uncle's house. And then one day, um, I guess they had been there for two or three weeks. Some people from my uncle's house came up and said they were having demonstrations. Uh, they had had one big sit-in in the restaurants, and they were arrests, and that they needed somebody local to show them where to go and where the streets were. My daughter was making cookies with some of her friends, and they agreed to do that. And that began it. It was initially high school and grammar school, local kids. Then, of course, the ministers there met with white folks downtown and agreed that, that they couldn't do anything about public accommodations until the demonstration stopped. So they ordered them stop. And it was at that point that the parents of those school children who supported them went down to Atlanta to the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and asked if they would support us and... Uh, and and let us know about their organizing and be there for technical assistance. And they said yes. And it was at that point that the Cambridge Nonviolent Action Committee became organized. Gloria's cousin, the bail bondsman, decided to step down as the committee chairman because he felt he had a conflict of interest providing bail for those getting arrested. Gloria was asked to take his place. The demonstrations continued. Children who were arrested and then released would go home, change their clothes, and go back out again. Some of the cops started uh, uh, shoving them and beating them and throwing them in the cars. Someone in the black community went door to door like uh, Paul Revere. So about 12 o'clock at night, we were in in the jails hearing this roar. But they came out in the night towns and whatever they had on, all the way downtown, which was like almost two miles around the jails when the when the um, sheriff and the police chief tried to, to, to arrange for them to go to other cities on the eastern shore. Those cities refused. They wouldn't let the jails be used. Many people refer to the turmoil that happened during and after public demonstrations as riots, but Gloria says the black community had a very different perspective. No, that was purely self-defense, the white folks coming and trying to burn down your home. And that, that happened, I guess, in late 70s, 
62 and early 63, almost nightly. You're listening to the Delmarva Almanac, and this is the story of civil rights activist Gloria Richardson Dandridge. The unrest led Governor J. Miller Taws to bring in the National Guard, who enforced a strict 8 p.m. curfew for all sides. They shut down liquor and gun sales and barred outsiders at the city border. The Guard also took over the jails when they found evidence of abuse. The black community formed a sort of working relationship with them that allowed some peaceful demonstrations to continue. But the little old ladies in my community would go out in the hot sunshine while they stand on the corner and take them uh, lemonade and iced tea and cookies. I can appreciate that. Now, at the time, I would like to take on some ladies and tilt them. Eventually, keeping the guard there began to cost the state a great deal of money. So state officials turned to U.S. Attorney General Robert Kennedy for help. He met directly with Gloria and other members of the Cambridge Nonviolent Action Committee. When we went up there, this, this, this man, uh, except he had these astonishing eyes, was standing at the door asking us to come in in khakis. And so I thought that this was just some intermediary instead of Robert Kennedy. We thought because... The president was going overseas and all around talking about democratic United States. And we gambled on the fact that he was not going to want a big disturbance over race next to the White House. And apparently he did. I don't think Robert Kennedy understood at first, but when we took the results of the survey we did and how and, and the poverty disaggregated from the, the national um census, when he saw how poor in the conditions that people lived in, that he began to, you know, to evince interest and, and to see what he could do from his position. Kennedy got the governor and the mayor to agree to all the committee's demands, including an ordinance to make segregation illegal in Cambridge. Then the mayor and city council tried to sidestep this by putting the ordinance up for a referendum. The black community boycotted the referendum standing on the principle that in a democracy, civil rights are inalienable and not dependent on elections. Nonetheless, by that September, the state enforced the desegregation of schools and hospitals, and by July 1964, the Civil Rights Act was passed, guaranteeing everyone their rights. In the years since, Cambridge has faced more conflict, but today work continues to make the entire community grow and prosper. Gloria returned her focus to her family life, despite the encouragement of many to run for public office. She felt that a platform had been built that people could now speak from. During her tumultuous work with the civil rights movement, Gloria fell in love with and married a photographer named Frank Dandridge. She left the Eastern Shore with him in 1964 and settled into life in New York, where she worked as a program officer in the Department of Aging, helping senior citizens. Gloria Richardson Dandridge is 93 and only retired from that work just 18 months ago. We'd like to thank our community partners, the Friends of Delmarva Public Radio, the Community Foundation of the Eastern Shore, and underwriters EatDrinkByArt.com for their help in bringing this program to you, our audience. Our theme music was provided by Brightside Studio. This show has been a Moonshell production. Thanks for listening. Until we meet again, may the rhythms and tides of Delmarva bring you good fortune.